Hey everybody, welcome to Reflections, the wisdom of Edgar Casey. We are coming to you courtesy of our broadcasting partner, moretalk.tv. This week on the show, we will be enjoying a presentation from the archives from Elsie Seacrest as she talks about the role of prayer in her life. For those who are unfamiliar, Elsie knew well-known psychic Edgar Casey personally and actually received several psychic readings of her own from Edgar during her lifetime. She was also an internationally known speaker on the topic of dreams, as well as the national director of the ARE's well-known study group program. She wrote a best-selling book entitled Dreams, Your Magic Mirror, and this book was based on more than 20 years of dream research that she had done. It started actually thousands of readers on their own personal journey of dream interpretation. This book, still available today, provides compelling evidence of the importance of studying and understanding dream symbols. You can pick up your copy at arecatalog.com. Hope everyone enjoys our presentation today from the archives with Elsie Seacrest. Since um, Casey left us almost 40 years ago, and I keep telling people I'm still 38, you know, there's some discrepancy there. I'm going to have to change that to at least 48 or 58. <laughs> Some of you, I hope you haven't heard these, but uh, uh, I wrote to uh, a commentator on television one morning uh, who had given these uh, on the air, and they are called The Lighter Side of the Church. How many of you have heard me give these? I, I've given them once or twice before, but uh, if you've heard it, well, smile anyway. Don't, don't act too bored. And these are announcements that appeared in church bulletins. Now, you know, uh, many of us who have worked with the church are not particularly gifted in writing and so we just want to make our announcements and the announcements come out but not always as they're supposed to so you bear this in mind uh, this afternoon there will be a meeting in the south and north end of the church children will be baptized at both ends <laughs> Maybe it would be a good idea, right? <laughs> Tuesday at 4 o'clock, uh, there will be an ice cream social. All ladies giving milk, please come early. <laughs> you see, they're availing themselves of every opportunity. <laughs> you, know, you notice your gentlemen not invited to that one. <laughs> Wednesday, the Ladies Literary Society will meet Mrs. Johnson. Will meet, and Mrs. Johnson will sing, Put Me in My Little Bed, accompanied by the pastor. <laughs> I wonder how the pastor felt about that one. <laughs> Thursday at 5 p.m. will be a meeting of the Little Mothers Club. All ladies wishing to become little mothers <laughs> will please meet the minister in his study. <laughs> do, we, do we have a sense of humor or an evil mind? Which is it? <laughs> Casey says a sense of humor is a sense of balance. Um, this being Easter Sunday... <laughs> We will ask Mrs. Johnson to come forward and lay an egg on the altar. <laughs> Would you believe it? <laughs> you haven't heard anything yet. <laughs> the service will close with little drops of water. One of the ladies will start quietly. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest of the congregation will join in. <laughs> the ladies of the church have cast off clothing of every kind, and they may be seen in the church basement on Friday afternoon. <laughs> And the last and the most bizarre of all, on Sunday, a special collection will be taken to defray the expenses of the new carpet. 
all those who wish to do something <laughs> on the new carpet <laughs> well please come forward and get a piece of paper <laughs> believe it, it's all printed. <laughs> uh, the title, The Role of Prayer in My Life. I think that perhaps... Well, see, I have the ability to completely close off my mind to what I said five minutes ago or two minutes ago. So I wondered why you were laughing, and then I remembered all of a sudden why you're still laughing. As I was thinking of this, um, the title, I thought perhaps how many times I have thought back to perhaps what I consider the greatest blessing in my life, and that was a mother and a grandmother who taught us very early in life to pray, who were spiritual-minded and set for us an example. And so the first of my childhood memories were and I was able to check with this uh, as time went on when I began to look back, that I was only two years old because my brother, my mother was dying uh, with the birth of my brother, who was two years younger than I, so I know I was only two years old. And I remember my grandmother uh, being on her knees praying, and I remember some of the relatives in there in the home praying because they thought my mother was dying at this childbirth. And... Uh, that was my first memory of whenever there seemed to be a problem in the home, there was prayer. I remember my grandmother and uh, the, uh, some of the people who came from foreign lands had uh, the idea that when we had a particularly vicious thunderstorm, that it was the Lord bringing to us uh, his attention or bring to our attention the fact that we were perhaps disobeying laws and that when we disobeyed laws, why punishment would come upon us because I asked her why she prayed so much during this time and she says the Lord is reminding us of his power and of his might and how we must obey his laws and then I remember every evening uh, before we went to bed all five of us children were brought together in the kitchen where it was warm and we all prayed in our night clothes before we went to bed Sundays was a day of prayer a Sundays was not a day of having fun or running around and doing things like that. It was a day of prayer and a day of relaxation. Uh, but I never remember a single Sunday when my mother and grandmother didn't have the Bible out reading it some portion of the day. Whenever there was a problem, an illness, I remember they're getting out the Bible and praying. Now you and I know from the Casey readings that there is no greater blessing for any of us than to be born in a family where the mother has prayed about that offspring or has prayed that she be a channel or has learned the art of prayer and coming to God. So I think for me, this was perhaps one of my, my greatest blessings. We prayed always before all of our meals and oftentimes after the meals. Um, my parents were, were very church-oriented so that uh, coming to America and uh, several of the members of the family, my grandmother, for instance, and grandfather, who had not learned to speak English, uh, we attended throughout our youth a German church in which we were very fortunate because we learned to speak German, to read German, to write German, and they believed in us. It was a Lutheran church, and you know how fundamental they are. They believed in Saturday school and Friday school and Sunday school. And believe me, we went. We learned the Bible and we learned to read and write in German. And we learned a great deal about biblical history and the importance of religion. So that for me, rather than perhaps at times I might have thought it was a chore, although I don't ever recall this in my youth, uh, for me as I look back, this was perhaps the greatest blessing that I had in this life to be born into a family where there was that great interest. Now, as many of you probably have had the same experience, we may have a very good background, and then as we leave home, as I did when I went in training, and then I met my husband, and we got married, and uh, he was a Methodist, I'd been a Lutheran, uh, you, you get away from the church. Uh, we hadn't been going to church for some time, 
And uh, I had a very serious heart condition. The doctor had given, had told my husband I had five months to live. There was constant deterioration going on. I'd been in bed for almost a year. And uh, so I began to feel that I was going to be an invalid all my life. And so I prayed. And I said, Lord, now I, I want to make a pact with you. Uh, I don't want to be a millstone around my husband's neck. This was in my late 20s. Uh, and so that he has a sick wife all of his life. Now, uh, if you will make me well, I will try to serve you if you will show me the way. And believe it or not, I began to get well the same time somebody gave me a book called History and Power of the Mind by Richard Inglis, introduced me to a, a teacher in New York who taught very much along these lines. And this seemed to be the answer to the prayer. And in eight months' time, I was taking swimming lessons and, uh, and took my, uh, I got my uh, award for swimming, was able to teach swimming. Now, this shows what can happen when... If there are desperate situations in our life where they may be coming to us to get us to look at what we're doing in life and perhaps to reroute our lives and to, to have a higher and better purpose. Now, I've been told since then through dreams that if I had not gone in that direction, I would not have lived. So that my purpose for me was to get into this work, into the KC work, let us say, and into this realm of higher dimension of learning in relationship to the spiritual and to understand a great deal more about God and the whole purposes of life. So uh, the, the, the work that I chose was also something in which I think the Lord had a hand. I had uh, uh, an attack of appendicitis when I was only 16, 17. And... Uh, the nurses were so lovely to me, so concerned and so gentle, that I decided right then and there, my mother had wanted me to be a teacher, that I wanted to be a nurse. Because I could think of nothing better than to help people, to comfort them when they were in pain, and when they were alone, and when they were in distress. And so, uh, over the protest of the whole family, because in those days, well, the nurses, well... They weren't elevated to the place they are today. And you really did a lot of hard, dirty work. It was 12 hours, and you cleaned bedpans as well as took bedpans, and you cleaned all your patients, and you did all these things. But that didn't matter to me. To me, I wanted to be of service to my fellow man. So in this fashion, I began to get closer to people to learn about their needs and so on. And perhaps the next great step for me in, in realization of the direction in which I wanted to go was when I was working at a hospital in which there was a great deal of polio. And uh, I could not understand a loving God. How could it be true what I had taught, been taught, that God blessed whom he blessed, loved whom he loved, cursed whom he wished to curse, and don't ask questions? Because many times I would ask questions at home and would say, these are things you must not ask God. He, in his wisdom, is doing what is right. Well, basically, I guess that's correct. But he also gave us intelligence, didn't he? He wants us to be co-workers with him, not slaves, not yes, sir, no, sir, but co-workers with him, equal with him to the degree that we would be of service to our fellow man, but always leaning on his principles, on his guidance, on his love, on his strength, knowing that we are a portion of him. And so I was going through a great difficulty at that time, too, and, uh, and I prayed again, and I was led then even closer to this sort of uh, uh, philosophy to help me understand reincarnation. Now, it wasn't easy for me to accept this, having been raised in a fundamental church. My husband, Bill, who heard it the first time, said he knew that was true. That was it. That was it. I think primarily, he isn't here this morning so I can say it, because he was raised in a very fundamental church. And he was swung over the fires of hell his whole lifetime. <laughs> And he said he was so tired and he was so terrified of God that it took a lot of prayer and meditation and knowing Casey and the readings to get him to even open the Bible. He would turn the color of this paper and beads of perspiration would form on his forehead of the terror that had been instilled into him about God when he was a child. Now, 
Why did he have that great, great fear? Well, Casey says that the real fundamental religions also have a purpose. It is literally to scare the devil out of you. Because you have a tendency to want to go in the other direction. And so he said, if you're born into a fundamental religion, there is a reason for it. If you're born into one which doesn't give you all those basic don'ts and, you know, swing you over fire all the time, it's because you've reached the place already where you're not going to be so tempted by the other side of life. And so, uh, listening to Casey, getting his readings, and these things which, again, because Casey knew how to approach us, he knew exactly what you were thinking. And he knew where you stood in consciousness. Now, in Bill's, he gave him four different lifetimes, which proved to Bill conclusively that this man whom we had never met, whom we had simply written to for readings, knew what he was talking about. Because he mentioned Bill's uh, talents without ever knowing him, without ever talking to him. And they weren't just general talents, they were specific talents. Whereas in mine, he just said, and I didn't know what he was talking about, I was to be a teacher of the way, the truth, and the light. You know, I thought, well, I tell the truth. You know, what, what's he talking about? <laughs> and, and the way, well, I guess that's to be a good girl if you can. And I'm trying. And, you know, it really didn't mean anything to me until much later when I began to study it. So all of these experiences, and if you look back in your own life, you'll see how these various experiences have molded you through pain, through sorrow, through stress oftentimes, in order to help you make decisions. So uh, I, I then became a nurse because, and then I find out from my Casey readings that I was a nurse in many lifetimes, not just this one, but in other lifetimes. And if you were a nurse 12,000 years ago, you know the state uh, that nurses had then or the acceptance that they had. Now, of course, that's unrecorded history, so I really don't know uh, uh, what how it was in those days, but uh, we know that the steps that they went through. Uh, perhaps the, the, the step that helped me as much as the Bible uh, and uh, my dreams and so on were the lives of the saints. Now, that's where those of you who are Catholics who have perhaps been drawn to read and study the lives of the saints will be ahead of most of us who haven't had that. Because as you study this, you will be amazed, especially if you get to know the Casey readings also, how much similarity there is in the messages, in the dreams, in the visions that they received in order to grow spiritually. And especially did I find this helpful in the lives of the, of, uh, um, of the life of the little flower, St. Teresa of Lisieux. She was a very humble person. And if you read her book, her own autobiography, you will think she read the Casey readings because she uses some terminology that's almost exactly like that of Casey. And then there are others, other lives of saints, that will help you a great deal to face certain things within yourself as you begin to awaken to the voices within, to the dreams, to the visions. And then I think the, the uh, important importance that Casey gave to studying and understanding and explaining for us the life of Jesus, of, of the example that he had and was to all of us, of the fact that he had been in this earth before, that he had also fallen. You know, for us, I think when we first are aware that we are to follow him, we say, but he was perfect. He was the Son of God, because we're taught that he alone came from the Father's house in that sense, that he alone was the one who was to guide us. And we didn't understand that he too had fallen, that he too had had other lifetimes where he had fallen to temptation. And therefore, the knowledge that he made it too, even after a fall, then you and I have a greater hope of making it because he's already made it and can show us the way. It gives us so much more strength in the knowledge that he also gave in to his weaker side and thus knows all of the pain, all of the anguish, all of the frustrations that you and I go through. And then when Casey added more to this by saying, even Jesus prayed every single day. The prayer that you and I need to watch for all the time Others first, Lord, others first. Because our tendency is to think of self. 
of me first. I, me, and myself. Why? Because we still share some of that with the animal kingdom of self-preservation and so on and so forth. But as we try to follow him, make that your daily prayer. Others first, Lord, others first. So that when an emergency arises, uh, when a temptation of some kind arises, uh, you know a bit of juicy gossip. Oh, boy, it's so juicy. You can't wait to tell it. But, unfortunately or fortunately, your discipline for this week is to say only that which is good in kind about others. And you can't do it. So you stretch a point and you come to class and you say, I know, I know I wasn't, but you know, there is something good I can say about my boss. He was mean to everybody this week. <laughs> now, that's a beginning, let's say, just a beginning. Because we do struggle with ourselves. We struggle with our own weaknesses of what will get you more attention than, oh, boy, you want to hear a bit of juicy gossip? You know something I heard? Oh, those ears are extended all the way across the room. And the softer you speak, the more the people will want to hear what you have to say. Why do we do that? Because we want attention. And until we realize that's all we want, and what a poor way to get it, uh, we, uh, we may not, uh, you know, see some of this gossip. So this prayer of, of Jesus is every day, I think, helped a great deal. I learned very early in our married life how important it was to pray, to pray constantly. And there were several instances that made me know how important prayer was because many of us don't learn about meditation yet, except that as we pray ardently, almost as if we were waiting for an answer to God, we are going into meditation. This is why in many of the churches, healing does take place, even though they know think nothing about meditation, of the sending forth of that energy. But they're praying so hard, and they're waiting and hoping that in that waiting and hoping, they have transcended the space between prayer and meditation, sending it on as a healing light to the person for whom they're praying. This is why many times when you read about prayer, you read a dissertation on prayer, and they describe what they call advanced prayer, they're really talking about meditation without using that term at all. They call it higher prayer, but it is taking us into these other dimensions. So in, uh, in, uh, whenever Bill was involved with what I call dangerous work, uh, uh, testing automatic pilot in airplanes, and uh, it was very dangerous work, and I kept dreaming that, um, that he was crashing. And I thought, oh, that's just my fear. And so I would just pray and just not say anything. And then one night I had that dream again. And this time a voice accompanied it just as I was waking up and said, you have been warned several times, soon it will be too late. Well, now that one caught my ear. It really caught my ear. I prayed the re all the rest of the night, falling asleep, waking up, praying, that he would be safe on this particular journey that he was on to get home safely. When he came home, I told him about it. And he said, well, you know what it means? It means my job. And I said, well, honey, better your job than your life. So uh, he said, I'm glad you love me. <laughs> and so <laughs> he, <laughs> he was afraid to tell the boss because, uh, you know, how many people believe in the psychic or in dreams or whatever. But to his utter amazement, his boss said, oh, don't worry, Bill. He said, you know, the trains still go from New York to California. He said, My, I, had a, I had a mother who was psychic, so we sure will not ignore Elsie's dream. Can you train somebody else to do your work and take over? And Bill said, yes, I've already started doing that. He said, fine, that'll be fine. Uh, to make a long story short, there were 12 of his co-workers that were killed in the crashes following that. Now, Bill would have been one of them if I can't prove it to you, and I'm glad I can't. But um, I, I believe this was a very valid dream. So from time to time, we have had the warnings where the Lord speaks to us in dreams and visions because we are trying, as, as Casey would say, trying to do his work. So, the role of prayer, I never start the day without praying. Never. I never go to sleep without my meditation and my prayer. I may fall asleep in the midst of it, but I'm going to do it. I never get into an airplane before taking off, and when we start taking off, that I don't pray and illuminate the cockpit with white light just in case they're being careless. I pray every time that airplane comes down, giving extra protection, 
giving extra alertness to the men in the cockpit. Now, every one of us can do this, and you can get a great deal of help. I think this is why Bill and I have been protected on our journeys around the world. So many people will say, aren't you afraid? I said, no. When it's my time, I know I'll go, as long as I'm doing the best I know how. We were warned just before we were to go into uh, Lebanon, before uh, all that war broke out there. We were due there to lecture at the University of Beirut. And the uh, morning before we were to leave Morocco, and it was about ten days hence when we would get there, a voice said, do not go to Lebanon. So I said to Bill, honey, we're not going to go to Lebanon. He said, why, you have to. We have engagements at the university. I said, I'm not going. You can go if you want to. I'm not going. Well, of course, when he heard that I had heard this voice, we didn't go. Well, the wars broke out on that day. And, of course, we would have been guests of the man who was the head of the Christian Phalangist movement there. They tried to kill him that day. They, stole, they uh, hijacked his son, uh, but his son had loaned his car to someone else, so his son was safe, and they let that other man go. But we probably wouldn't have been able to get out of Lebanon for our next journey. So the, the, the prayer that we have whenever we go on a trip is a prayer of protection. We'd gotten off in some, oh, we were, I think, headed for, uh, oh, uh, Oh, one of those Middle Eastern countries. And they wouldn't let us go into the airport. Sixteen people had just been shot. Well, of course, I was about to go in. So Sixteen people had just been shot. But we have absolutely no fear because we know that as long as you're trying and it isn't your time yet. Bill says, how do you know it isn't your time? I said, well, I, I don't know. But what does it matter? I can't think of a better way to go than finishing your work and like a ripe apple dropping from the tree of life and rolling into the next dimension. I don't want to die of old age, sitting in a rocking chair for 10, 15 years, not knowing who I am. Do you? Does anybody here? And what, those of us who are part of the ARE, who's afraid of the next dimension? At least you don't have a physical body to feed and carry around. Of course, I don't know what the other bodies are that we may have. <laughs> We'll have what we have earned, whatever that may be. If I'm an eagle just out of a great big head like this, and everybody, will, everybody with me will have a big head, and everybody will know more than I know because they know they know everything. <laughs> Is that hell? That's hell. Okay. <laughs> so I just pray, Lord, help me to do Thy will as Thou seest. I have need of it. And every day in every way, I think we we get a little bit of guidance. The Edgar Casey readings, of course, you never learn to understand all of them. He gave these readings to individuals on particular levels of consciousness. They were particularly meaningful to those people. I've discovered this as the years have gone by. And so you have to study many times to really understand what he's talking about. And if you've read the book on Revelation, the Casey readings on Revelation, you know you need another couple of readings to understand the readings on Revelation. But these were given to a special group, that first group that worked with him, that no doubt lived, many of them, if not most of them, lived during the time of Jesus. They knew John. They probably knew his vocabulary as well. They understood what he was talking about. And, of course, for the first time, we understood the mystery of Revelation, that it was John's dreams and visions on the island of Patmos. And not some great mystery hidden. Uh, it is a mystery, of course, because who knows himself? The mystery of ourselves, the mystery of the awakening, and the mystery of all the figures that appear in our dreams. So the, 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 the prayers, I find, also would lead me at times uh, to uh, look up a particular passage in the Bible. And, uh, and I, found that th I find that this is very, very helpful. If, for instance, you have a decision to make on something, and you do the right thing. It's an unselfish thing. You don't want to do it, but you know you must do it. So you make that decision. I've discovered that not until you have made the decision will the Lord come and corroborate that you made the right decision. If it's a selfish one, he's not going to step in because your will must be purified according to your ideals and by yourself. Now, it's true that dreams frighten us, and sometimes we know we're going in the right direction, and they will help us. But other times, you will then be told, read, or you hear a voice saying, read uh, Joshua 1.9. And uh, it will say, uh, 
Be not afraid, be not discouraged, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. And it was an answer to a decision that you had made that uh, you thought would separate you from the work of the ARE, that would isolate you to such an extent that you wouldn't be able to do the work, but you had to do it for your husband's sake. And then you discovered, after you had made that and after you had moved to this remote when you have a choice to make. Many times I think my husband takes advantage of me because he says to me, I'm not going to make this decision. You're going to make it. And oftentimes it relates to him and his work. And I said, that's not fair. You make it. He said, no, I want you to be happy. I said, but that's not fair. I want you to be happy. So you make it. So for, I usually give in anyway, and I usually make the decision. After prayer, if meditation is needed, then I enter meditation. Now, some of you have heard me speak on prayer and meditation before, but I do want to tell you how your own process changes as you need to get answers which you cannot get from your conscious mind. I still precede all approaches to God with prayer. Now, you may say, well, uh, is it always God who answers you? I don't know. That's not important, is it? As long as we address God and as long as we weigh whatever comes with common sense. If I were praying to God and a voice said, kill your mother-in-law, well, I know that some reason a door had opened up and uh, some evil force had come in because God wouldn't tell me to kill my mother-in-law. So, uh, unfortunately, that has never happened. So I always, uh, she was a lovely woman. She's passed on. You know that, Mother. Uh, and uh, so I, I always address my prayers to the very highest force. Now, it is true that there are times when I've heard the voice of Edgar Casey. Now, this happened three or four months ago. And it was the first time. Now, I've contacted him in dreams, but this was the first time that I heard his voice. Now, what I do is to mentally quiet my mind as we do in meditation. I sit up. I don't lie down because I, I fall asleep probably. So I sit up in a very comfortable position with my head reclining on a pillow. And I will then say, Lord, what is the cure for this situation? And I mention whatever it is. In the last case, it had to do with an allergy for, uh, for uh, um, fish. I developed an allergy for fish, and I broke out in hives. And uh, I went into meditation. I saw a hand that came out and showed me garlic. So I eat, every time I eat fish, I follow it with garlic. I have no allergy. Uh, I don't have the hives, but I don't have many friends who come very close to me you know, in, that, in that particular period. So I had been doing that, and uh, I ate fish about, oh, I guess six months ago, and I broke out in hives, and I did have my garlic. So when I had a chance and got over that awful situation, I went into meditation, and I said, Lord, what happened? What happened? And then I listen. Now, this is the meditation part. I'm sitting there, and I say, what happened, Lord? And then I listen. And in the listening, I become unconscious for a moment. Just, you say, drift off, go to sleep, whatever you want. But it's always just a moment, just going into unconsciousness. And then I come back with the answer. I may see it written on a blackboard. I may see it printed as if on my brain. I may hear it. I may see it on a piece of paper. It's never the same way. But it has never been wrong in 30 years of working with it this way. So I, I, I asked and I listened. And then as if, and I said for the first time since he's passed on, I heard his voice and it was as if it came from 10 million miles away in outer space. You know, you've heard echoes. Oh, this is an echo that was really, a, they say in some places in the south, a fur piece away. And I said, what, you know what happened? And the first thing that I saw, well, first I saw a vision. And the vision was of, of two white horses followed by two black horses. Well, I related that to the energy centers, the white horses, the energy of the gonads, and the next for balance which said to me that for some reason I must double the number there. So before I would dare eat fish again, I went again into meditation and I said, have I interpreted this correctly, that I should double the amount of garlic pills that I should take? 
And then it was that I heard Casey's voice in outer space. And he said just one word, which I'd heard him say when people would ask questions when he was giving a reading. And that one word was, exactly. <laughs> so I had absolutely no fear. My bill said, oh, aren't you afraid? You know, you know, because every time I get that, it covers more of my body. And I said, no, because it was Casey's voice. Couldn't be anybody else's. And he said, but well, it's the first time you heard Casey. I said, but he wouldn't fool me. Of course he wouldn't. And, of course, ever since then, I, and you know what I discovered after that? That Bill had bought a new bottle, and they were half the strength of the old ones. Now we always look at the strength, because this time they're about five times the strength, and I'm just taking ten instead of sixteen. And I probably will take eight the next time, which would be about half. But I come down very, very slowly, you know, because I'm... Who loves me enough to stand and scratch me all night and all day? It's the only way I can sleep. Poor Bill, he doesn't get any sleep, and I don't get much sleep. So you'll find that, that meditation then takes you into these realms where Casey got all of his information. You can do that, too. If Casey said it once, I heard him say it a hundred times to different people who came and said, Oh, Mr. Casey, you're so wonderful. You have all these gifts. And he'd say, You can do this, too. Are you willing to pay the price? And I still hear people. It always distresses me. The people still running everywhere to psychics everywhere instead of working on themselves on prayer and meditation and the art of listening. As the readings say, how long, how long is it going to take us before we take the shortcut, which is to the divine within ourselves? Why run all the way across the nation to get a psychic when the best one is waiting right here? And all of this starts with ardent prayer and then meditation and expectancy and the listening. And over and over, remember, we must always say, as Jesus taught us, Thy will be done. Remember someone uh, telling me about an experience that they had had. They were having a great many problems with her husband. Uh, with her husband, not there. She only had one. Uh, with her husband. And, uh, and it was, I think, a part of our uh, dream course at that time where after listening to the music, we met with our dream guidance figure. Uh, most of us, of course, chose Christ, and she had chosen Christ. And we ask a question in relationship to a, a problem that we have difficulty in meeting. And she was asking about uh, the frequent arguments and disputations she was having with her husband. How could she better get along with her husband? Because she said she truly loved him. And she said, Jesus spoke to her. And he said, first of all, Whenever you become angry, see my face over his. Smile and then close your lips and be silent. And she began to do that and it was almost like a miracle in her life. Because even visualizing the face of Christ on her husband helped her to begin to see how many wonderful qualities he really had instead of harping on just the couple that, that annoyed her so much. And if we understand the readings, we bring into our lives those people who will help to bring out our best qualities. And unfortunately, it's not always just how wonderful you are, how glorious you are, and they don't sit at your feet worshiping you as they do the first two, three months maybe. You know, then they begin to exert themselves in their own directions, which is what marriage is all about, learning to love others as well as yourself. So I thought that was a lovely uh, experience that I'd like to share with those of you who may have some altercations with your husband or your wife or your children or your in-laws or those people like your neighbors whom Casey said you often have lifetime after lifetime. These are all ways in which we learn to love one another. Casey said, what is our relationship to him, to the Christ? What is our relationship in our daily life? Is he near or is he far? Have you talked to him as you would a real father, confessing, asking for his help and guidance? Have you prayed expectantly? 
Have you played, prayed reverently? Here is some, I thought you might be interested in some of the types of prayer that I looked up today in a very old Bible, which I think is, it's impossible to get anymore. It's out of print, called the Hitchcock Bible. First of all, he gave this, a yearning of the soul to know God, which may bring him with it perhaps the most ardent of prayers. Second, he brings forth the conditions of acceptable prayer. First, we must pray in his name, in Christ's name. Second, in faith, believing that it will be heard. Three, in sincerity. We really mean what we're praying about. Four, in righteousness. Is this a righteous prayer? Or am I saying, Lord, tell me what my opponent is trying to do. Or tell me if he's as far advanced as I am. Tell me his weaknesses. Is it a righteous prayer? The Bible says the prayer of the righteous is heard, but the prayer of the unrighteous is not heard. We pray in humility and in patience, knowing that oftentimes God says, not yet. We must pray with forgiveness and confession. Forgiveness for others if we want God to forgive us. Confession that we know we're not perfect and we want more help. With perseverance. For the promises in the Bible are that he will hear our prayers, even though the answer sometimes is delayed. The purpose then is for regeneration. We want to know God and his opinion of us and we'll hear how he sees us in order that we may be regenerated. To become more aware of that which we may meet now. Don't ever ask for all of your sins to be revealed to you. You'd give up from the time you and I were in the caves. You know, there are a lot of things in us that the Lord is hiding from us until such a time as we can meet it. And this is, of course, that you read about the dark night of the soul that it goes through. And you and I will go through periods like this where we think we've got it pretty well made and then something devastating happens and we seem to have lost the God that we had. And this is a call for deeper prayer, deeper meditation, more patience in order to pick up virtues that we didn't know we didn't have. Prayers in which we ask for pardon, in which we ask for guidance and salvation. Prayers in which we ask the Lord to help us to be more obedient. For a renewal. You know, we often, and this is what, of course, the purpose of, of meditation and prayer are, and that is to have that enthusiasm, which means entheos or full of God. It is meditation that brings that enthusiasm. And this is why it is so important to, again, lift this creative force within yourself so that you are aware of it and that it becomes more and more active in your own lifetime. And this brings the revival, the renewal, not only of the physical body, but of the mental and the spiritual. It brings divine growth. It brings a sanctification, a willingness to give up certain th foods, let's say, or certain drink, or certain activities. Not because they're specifically wrong, but perhaps because this is demanded of you at this present time. You will learn, as most of us did, to bless your food. Why? Not just to bless it because you should bless it, but as Casey pointed out, it enables the body to better assimilate that food. And that's why he also said, ladies, if you're angry at your children or your husband, don't prepare food at that time because you'll put your anger in that food and you'll give them all stomach ache or indigestion. Think of that. So wait until you cool off or let them make their own sandwiches. They'll have a lot less trouble with digesting it. When, you know, if you have been practicing prayer and meditation, then when an emergency arises, you have no trouble. 
going to this period of silence within yourself. You know the way because you've been there every day and you know the answer will come. It may be, be patient. The tide will turn. And just hearing that voice say, be patient, the tide will turn, gives you the courage and the strength to wait because it has never been wrong. It has never led you astray. Protection and deliverance, and these were, of course, biblical times, and, of course, if you're uh, uh, serving your country, uh, from the war, from enemies. Now, you may think that uh, uh, if our country needs to protect itself, that you ought not to go to war. Someone asked Edgar Casey this, and Mr. Casey said, we owe our country its protection. And he said, if, however, you would not kill and don't want to kill anyone for any reason at all, he said, then the Lord will so guide you that you will not be in any area of the forces where you have to kill somebody. Now, Hulian and his brother both entered as common foot soldiers. They had college degrees. They could have gotten off, uh, higher officer uh, positions. But Casey warned them that they must enter in as just the ordinary foot soldier. Hugh Lynn was put into, uh, into uh, radar. No, his brother was put into radar. And Hugh Lynn was put into morale building forces area. Neither one of them ever had to point a gun at anyone. So again, it has to do with trusting in the Lord and that which you really desire within yourself will be your protection always. More and more, I think, uh, as Edgar Casey pointed out, the opportunities come to us in life as we expand our activities. And this is why, uh, while today's trend is not to get married, not to get involved, he said that the very angels in heaven sang when man and woman had reached the place where they were willing to take each other, dedicate each other, keep the children in order to train them in spiritual principles. He said this was a great thrust forward in this movement because there was a much greater opportunity to learn to serve one's fellow man, to meet with those whom you've met with before, to work with them all towards the development of, and the hastening, let's say, of this next period that we're all working towards, the return of the Master, the thousand years of peace. And I always like to remind you, gentlemen, that during that period, and I want you to remember, during that period, Mr. Casey said, the Immaculate Conception is going to be quite common. Thus, if you go out on a business trip, and you come home three months later, and you said, your wife says, Darling, I am pregnant with the Immaculate Conception. You better believe it. It was possible. Think of the... Don't laugh so loud back there. <laughs> think... But think... <laughs> I don't think he believes it, does he? <laughs> You study the case he reads and he'll see and you see what he says about many high souls coming into the earth at that time. Now maybe you and I don't know any of them in this lifetime, but there will be many present at that time. And those of you who want to come back, ask in a dream or before you go to sleep about your next lifetime. I asked I said, and I, I knew several people, including my mother and grandmother, whom I would like to be born to. And I said, so I prayed one night before I went to sleep. Is it, if it's right and if it's why? Well, always say if it's right, you know. It might just be curiosity and that can lead you into trouble. Um, who will be my parent, my mother, in my next lifetime? And I wasn't given that answer at all. But I was given an answer that was far more satisfying. And I think it's, it will be, for me, in a measure, a reward for my trying in this lifetime. And so the answer was, you will be born to a dedicated group. Now, this means, I think, those people who know about the return of the Master. And then the last time we spoke up at Estes Park, a young man and I said, maybe one of you in the audience will be my parent. And this young boy, I think he was about 16, came to me and said, you can come and be my little girl if you want to. And I, thought, 
I thought, well, bless your heart, but I do want a little rest first. <laughs> but but, but th- think, think how much joy you and I should have because of this knowledge that you and I are helping to prepare this period. Through our prayer, through our meditation, through our activities with those whom we come in contact with. This is not a dream. This is truth. And you know, if you know the readings, the Master spoke to Casey on more than one occasion. Others from the Bible spoke to Casey. And so, this material, I believe, is as valid as that material which John received uh, when he was on the island of Patmos. Sometimes in mysterious words, but ever to inspire us, to help us, to know that the Master is going to return and you and I can have a part in it. Thank you. Yes. Uh, is there uh, anything in the readings that says when the master is coming more or less? Yes, it said sometime after the year 2000, after the shifting of the poles, when the people have made it possible for him to return. And after the year 2000, there will be that 1,000 years of peace when people who have sought to make trouble in the world will be held in other dimensions and not be permitted to be born. Otherwise, the way we see things going, how can we ever have peace? No. But they will be held in other dimensions, learning lessons there when the Master comes again and uh, brings with him, you know, many of the angelic kingdom. Yes. Did he mention uh, what organized religion would have to do or there were any attitudes that, that the organized churches would have to begin to adopt? Uh, the question is, did he mention anything about organized uh, churches and attitudes and so on? As far as I know, no, he did not. But there are many movements in this direction whether we speak about the ARE now, which is basically a fundamental religion, except that we accept reincarnation. I think there are small groups working all over the world in doing this same thing. Now, I do know from the readings that uh, there are a number of Essenes that had readings, and they were among those, of course, that helped to prepare the way for his coming then, and that are in the earth now that will be coming back again. Yes? The question about the coming of Christ is the generation that sees the coming together of Israel is supposed to be the generation that sees the coming of Christ again. Uh, that's a long time, since 1948 to sometime after 2000. I don't, I don't know the quote that you're making about the coming well, of Israel. In the scriptures it says that the generation, I think Jesus said that, uh, the generation that uh, sees the coming together of Israel will see the Christ again. All right, well is this not the period? Well, I would think it would be sooner. Oh, honey, it takes us so long. I think biblically, a generation is considered about 30 to 40 years. Well, that, that may be true, too, but uh, remember that you'll be coming back, too. So while you will be seeing the beginning of the coming together, let's say, of the land of Israel, and remember that the word Israel also, sometimes uh, we do not understand it. Uh, the word Israelites really means those who worship the one God. And doesn't just mean the Jews. You have a generation that's 1949. I believe it's yeah, it's called 25 years, isn't it? I think Casey said a generation was 25 years. Well, they have, you know, they, after all, we were instrumental in, in helping them to have that land back again. And uh, the, the the problems, I think this is still uh, uh, Judah and, uh, no, who are the two brothers that fought? I think they're still fighting. Israel. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. Right, right. Yes. I don't think it'll be a stupid question. If it's a necessary question, it's not stupid. Why some of the dreams are in symbols, like coded language and not direct? Why are some of the dreams in coded language and not, not uh, direct? I think because we need to work at understanding something that we already know but are paying little attention to. We know the laws. Why do I have to be told that eating too much chocolate cake is, is dangerous for me? I know that. But I have to be scared out of my wits before I, I pay much attention to it. Find myself in a hospital bed. That'll cure me in a hurry. So uh, it, we bring these things upon ourselves. I think that uh, at times, and certainly it's been my experience, when it's a real emergency, like just don't go to Lebanon. Or uh, I had bought some meat one day and brought it home and Bill that night before I cooked it the next day saw it uh, covered with uh, bugs and vermin. 
Well, it meant that something in the process that was not good. So we threw it away and didn't eat it. Yes. Oh, okay. I still got one minute. I don't you dare cheat me out of two minutes of eleven. That, well, I, mine is correct. That I know. Two minutes more. <laughs> I do know it is. Yes. Yes. I won't get a chance to talk to them again this week. Yes. I'm just going to mention this man over here. Like, for example, the Hopi prophecy mentioned, they say that there will be one religion and one tongue, and that a great spiritual master will return again. And that's almost exactly what the reading says. Right. Right. We're talking about, of course, after the shifting of the poles, and as, as, as the readings point out, there will be a new order, new world order. Anyone else? Yes. yes. The, um, the uh, idea that Jesus had lived before, who was he in previous lives? Well, there were, there were about seven that Casey gave, but he had 33 incarnations altogether. And uh, uh, he was Adam. He was, um, uh, what was the first word that returned to the Father right at... Yeah. Yeah. No, but well, he was Melchizedek, but he was Joshua, and he was Jeshua. Uh, no, he wasn't Abraham, he was Joseph in Egypt, but one before that. Uh, Enoch. Enoch, yes. Whom the Bible says did not die, but uh, went to heaven. So, uh, you see, he, uh, in, in several of his lifetimes, I think this is why Casey said in the reading, uh, when you study him as uh, Joshua... Study him as the man of peace rather than the man of war. Because if you know that whole story, there were some horrible things that took place. But we don't understand that the reason that he was told to kill all of the people at that period was because there were still so many of the mixtures of animal as well as man. And in order to get a pure race started all over again. But it brings, uh, you know, there was suffering and there was killing and there were those things going on. So there was a process of regeneration and cleansing. Yes. Well, yes, uh, uh, he mentioned uh, that he uh, lived during the period um, of um, uh, Persia, and uh, and he was, what was his name? Zend. Zend. And uh, you've, you've all heard of Zend. Now, there were several Zends in history, but this was during that 12th, about 12,000 B.C. period. And then, I, as far as I know, uh, no one asked about any of the others. We probably wouldn't have uh, known the names anyway in history. But he came whenever he could be of great service. All right, the lady's watching, and she says, even your two minutes is up, I love you. But come, you may have the floor, Kathy. <laughs> Hope everyone enjoyed our presentation from the archives today with Elsie Seacrest as she talked about the role of prayer in her life and the healing potential of prayer. If you'd like to learn more about Edgar Casey and his incredible legacy, as well as the incredible people who were involved with him during his lifetime, people like Elsie, you can visit our website at edgarcasey.org. On behalf of everyone here at the Association for Research and Enlightenment and moretalk.tv, I'm your host, Brenton Bickerstaff, wishing you a wonderfully enlightened week. Thank you so much for tuning in. Much love. And now it's time for the Thought for the Day here on Reflections, the wisdom of Edgar Casey. And joining us as always for the Thought for the Day today is Bill Austin. Bill, thank you so much for joining us today on the show. Hi, Brent. Always great to be here. Thank you once again for having me. My pleasure. And if you don't mind going ahead and reading the Thought for the Day today for our listeners. I'd be happy to. <clears throat> this thought comes from reading... 262-106 Try in your own experience each that you speak not for one whole day unkindly of any that you do not say a harsh word to any about any and see what such a day would bring to you. Speak not for one whole day unkindly of any. So I wonder what other impossible tasks he has for us. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I say that jokingly, but that that's a tough one. You know, uh, because even though he says, 
go through a day without saying anything, knowing how, you know, what comes out of our mouth is an extension of our, or a projection of our thoughts. You know, try going through the day without having an unkind thought about anyone. What challenge this is. You know, and when I look at this, who was this reading for? You know, the 262 series of readings was for the original Search for God group. So this is one of the exercises that he gave them. You know, and, and what an exercise, you know, for any of us to try to apply. I might have to break it down into, you know, five-minute increments. You know, we'll see if I can uh, do that. But uh, what a challenge to do that. And <clears throat> what an opportunity to really see where your mental patterns, as you had mentioned before, really are at. And go beyond just not what just comes out of my mouth, but what just went through my thought at that point. You know, uh, you might keep a little... Uh, counter in your pocket to see uh, <laughs> how many times you cross the barrier. So, <laughs> may not like the results, or I may not like my results. So I, I think it's a beautiful, challenging reading, you know, that can you go through the day without a thought or saying anything unkind to someone else? It's a beauty. It's a good one. Yeah. It's wonderful. And I love that you raised the idea that it is. It's a challenge because... It really is. This this is um, something that I work with a lot, and it's not easy. I, I catch myself, you know, speaking unkindly all the time, and and it's important to to stay focused on that because you can, you know, I've I've found that I also have made a lot of improvements in that in that regard. But I love that uh, you say this is a challenge, and it is. It's a great exercise, and I think what this makes me think of is why is this not an exercise that they do in school. You know, this would be something that would be incredibly important to, to be brought up as, as a principle, as a practice to incorporate into educating our kids. You know, have them keep this into focus that, you know, try not to speak unkindly about anybody for one whole day. It should be, you know, it should be a national holiday that we should be celebrating. This is such a powerful, you know, powerful practice, a powerful tool for us to all, you know, keep conscious of. Um, and it always reminds me that Casey in his readings said that, that gossip is sin. He, he referred to, you know, gossip as is what he, you know, someone asked him about it. And he said, well, I, I would say that if you want to know what sin is, look at gossip. It's about speaking poorly about other people because as we know, everyone is just a reflection of ourselves. So if you're speaking poorly about other people, you, you're connected to that person. So you're, you're in a sense just speaking poorly about yourself. So you're bringing, you know, nothing good to the table in that regard. So I think when he says try in your own experience in this reading, it's this is incredibly powerful practice that everybody should really be giving a try. And you know, we're not we we can't expect to be perfect at it right away, but it's it's an important daily practice that you know, like you said, if you can just break it down to small intervals. If you can't do a whole day, that's fine. You know, we don't we're not expected to be perfect spiritual, you know, adepts right off the bat. But um if, if you can if you can work with this principle, it's an incredibly powerful practice. One thing that you said that was encouraging is that you have been working with it and you have been improving. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And uh, I've never heard you say an unkind word, so I think you're probably doing really well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Likewise. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing with, with us in the thought for the day today, Bill. It's a pleasure to have you on the show as always. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you once again for having me. Have a great day. You too. Thanks. Perfect. Okay. I'll reset. All right. And now it is time for the thought for the day today here on Reflections, the wisdom of Edgar Casey. And joining me on the show, as always, is Dr. Bill Austin. Bill, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us for the thought for the day. Hi, Brent. Thank you once again for having me. It's great to be back with you. 
It's a pleasure to have you on again. Now, if you can go ahead and read the thought for the day today for our listeners. I'd be happy to. This thought comes from reading 2271-1. For the experience of sojourn in the earth is not by chance, but the natural spiritual and soul evolution of the entity, that it may be aware of its relationship to God through its relationships to its fellow men, recognizing in each soul, as well as in self, those possibilities, those opportunities, those duties, those obligations that are a portion of each soul entities manifesting in a material plane. This is one of those thoughts that says, uh, here's why you're here. This is what we yeah. do, you know, that uh, this, is, this is not a mistake here. You know, you're not here by chance. Uh, the readings talk about how we choose these uh, opportunities. The stage has been set and we make the choice to, uh, to come. And uh, that it's a very natural part our, of our evolution. And it's the opportunity to really become aware of our relationship with God. And this next part is so important. Through its relationship, our relationships to our fellow man, to every person that we come in contact with. You know, that we're here to experience God and we'll do that through our relationship with others. You know, that puts a whole new thought on how we react to others, how we interrelate with others, our responsibility to others, our being our brother's uh, keeper, of taking care of each other as well as ourselves, but that we're responsible for everyone. And, and, and it's not like we have to go looking for this other person. They're going to be placed in front of us all of the time. And it's our relationship with everyone else. Not just the ones we want to have a relationship with, but with everyone else. You know, such an important reading. You know, so many wonderful principles in here and such an eye-opener of what are we doing? What's it all about? Yeah, definitely. This reading is, as you said, it's it's a really powerful one. It's it's one of those ones that it is an eye opener. It's it's kind of a he has these certain readings that are summaries of the big question. They're kind of he answers the big question, and in this he he answers why we're here. You know, the purpose of us incarnating here on Earth. He he lays it out very plainly. And I love, I love how plainly he lays it out, how simple he makes it. He says, you know, we're here as, as a natural, this is part of the experience. It's not by chance. It's a very natural thing. This is part of our spiritual evolution. But he also goes on, as you said, to, it's, to be aware of our relationship to God. And then, you know, of course, so many people have, are, are, are really tossing around what their idea of God is. And so many people are waking up to what you know, how God can be this, this infinite idea, this creative force that exists everywhere and is working through everything. And in order to clarify that, Casey goes on and says that in order to be aware of your relationship to God, we, we do it best here on earth by incarnating and working with our relationships to our fellow men. And that is such an important reminder from the Casey material to realize that it's going to be our relationships, as difficult as they may seem, that that's where we're going to we're, we're going to learn to see to see God and see ourselves and everyone else as part and parcel of God. And he also goes on in, in this excerpt, it it's, has so much in it, where he says there's these possibilities and these opportunities and also these duties. So it's important to remember that because we can have these relationships that can walk into our life and not, they can rub us wrong and we may move on and hold on to some negativity surrounding that relationship. And I think it's important to realize that this was all an opportunity, all uh, 
a situation that opens up huge possibilities to us. And it's also we have duties to, to people. You know, we have these people walk into our life. When someone walks into our life or we start a new relationship, we in a sense do have a duty to that person in that we we have a duty to treat that person in the best way that we possibly can to help uplift their life, to help be of service to them. And that's why we're here. That's the reason why we incarnate here on earth is to, you know, give ourselves constantly to, to life and, and the relationships that, that manifest during, you know, this given lifetime. Yeah. So many wonderful things uh, in this particular reading. Yeah, this one's great. Excellent. Well, I'm glad we got the opportunity to talk about this one, Bill. It's always a pleasure to have you join me for the Thought for the Day, so thank you so much. Oh, thank you. It's been great as always. Well, have a wonderful day and a great week. Thank you. You too. I'll see you next week. I look forward to it. Bye-bye.